Hello, my quilting friends. My name is Leah Day, and welcome to episode 47 of the podcast. Today, I'm chatting with Laura Lynn Fulford. She is the mom from the Mom and Pop Quilt Shop, and she shares videos online too, quilting on her long arm. And she's from Canada, so this is another international culture that we have on the show today. So I hope you're looking forward to getting to know Laura Lynn and hearing her perspective. I kind of picked her brain a little bit about uh, filming and videos on a long arm and she was super, super helpful. So I hope you're looking forward to this interview. Now, a few updates about what's going on around the house. I have a really exciting thing and it is my gingerbread house. It's done. So this was a project that I started many, many years ago. I actually have Leah Day 2013 here written on the bottom. Uh, and if you are listening to the podcast, please know that there's also show notes and you can come and see a really nice picture of this and how I put it together. So basically this was a, uh, a 2D, a flat needlepoint that I bought a painted canvas from a needlepoint store and then finally sat down and kind of put myself in jail and worked on it every single night while um, watching a Star Trek episode with my family. And then I was going to send it off to have it finished, but Susie St. James kind of gave me the kick in the pants that I needed. She was like, she commented, it was like, do you not know stitching? <laughs> Is your work for the year not challenged? And so she kind of threw down <laughs> and I had to, I had to try it myself. I was worried. I was really terrified that I was going to cut into this thing and then all my hard work was going to be just kaput, you know? Uh, so I was really careful and focused on what I was doing and I'm so happy about how it turned out. And yes, you know, while making it was an ordeal and an effort, I am so pleased that it's finished and it's now a cute little gingerbread ornament to hang on my tree. I'll probably hang it up somewhere all year round just to appreciate it for this first year that I have it finished because hey, that's an accomplishment, you know, five year project done. Uh, and so I fully anticipated to turn away from cross stitch and go jump into all of those little hexes that I know I have for another goddess quilt. But I was putting away my cross stitch supplies and all of my floss and I ran across another cross work, cross stitch project and that is this one. So this is a little goddess that I started, and I'm pretty sure this was started in 2000 or 2001. So I was 17 years old. Uh, yeah, <laughs> this is a long-term one and it needs to be finished up. And again, you can come and find the show notes at, at, uh, on our blog, freemissionproject.com, and you can see a picture of it. It is a goddess. Really, originally, the inspiration was Mother Earth and kind of representing all of the different seasons um, or the different elements. I've got, you know, her arms are kind of green for grass and blue for water and her hair is fire and her face is earth. It's brown. Um, and I can remember designing it and being a kid, you know, teenager and kind of emo. <laughs> And thinking, you know, oh, you know, the world is so polluted and everything is so terrible and she's sad and she's crying and the earth is dying and very melodramatic, I gotta say. Um, and, I, you know, it's not that I don't believe that now. It's just that I, I see creating things is in a very different way. I just feel like it's better to make something pretty than something grumpy. <laughs> and I shared a picture of this uh, on Instagram and Facebook and several people commented like, wow, that's a really grumpy goddess, Leah. You know, like she doesn't look all that happy. Um, so I am gonna update her face. I am gonna make some changes there. Uh, and I think the simple fact of the matter is I probably put this away at, whenever I did, uh, when I was a teenager, because I did not want to finish her that way. I didn't want her to have a grumpy face. And um, I think another reason why I quit working on it is because I didn't really plan to add a border to it. Uh, it started out as the design of the goddess figure, and that was actually designed for beadwork. And then I was, I kind of was really getting out of beadwork and not really into doing something with that. So I ended up stitching her in cross stitch, and then it stayed in this unfinished state for so long because I got too close to the edge of my Ada cloth. Uh, and I was fr it was fraying, and I didn't know how to handle that. I didn't know what to do. And I could remember just feeling a lot of anxiety about getting so close to the edge and it nearly fraying and it's gonna be ruined and I couldn't complete the border that I wanted to add around her. Uh, and so it just went into that stuck place. You know what I'm talking about, you know, where it's just like, 
I want to finish it, but I can't finish it because this is wrong with it, but I don't know how to overcome that. And it's fascinating to be working on this. Um, just pulling it out uh, as soon as I finished the gingerbread and then saw this one, it was like, I have got to work on this. I have got to get it out of this stuck state. And um, what's interesting is while I was totally ready for a break on cross stitch, the feel of working on this is very, very different because I want to work on this one. Uh, I want to get it out of this unstuck state. Uh, and the skill that I have now at 34 years old, I looked at this and was like, well, that's no problem. I stitched and stabilized that edge that was fraying. I added ribbon all the way around it. So that way um, that would seal off the edges basically and kind of give me a border to work off of. I might end up covering that up when she's finished. I might end up um, at, you know, leaving the ribbon on. I don't know. But for now, I was able to get it where it needed to go just to be able to get back to stitching on it. Uh, and then I used a pen to mark the rest of the design. I did make some mistakes and I'll have to sort those out later. And, you know, there's that terror of pulling something out that was precious and perfect. And, oh my gosh, now I'm 34 years old and I'm going to go mess up something that I started when I was 17. Um, but I had to overcome that and just say, you know what, a anything would be better than what's going on with it now. And that is unfinished for 20 years plus. And uh, it needs to be done. It needs to be done this year and it needs to be done right now. So this feels really good. And, uh, and I really didn't expect that. I did not expect to be going right straight into another cross stitch project at all. I expected to be piecing tiny little hexes right now. And that's just how life goes. I think the next project that you need to work on, it's gonna present itself to you and you need to follow that little nudge and see where it goes, you know? Uh, it is going to be a little bit of a struggle to finish her because, of course, this floss that I was using, I'm actually finishing off the tail that I left 17 years ago, um, but I don't have that blue. I don't know what color it was, so I'm going to go to the craft store today and look around and see what I can find to hopefully match it pretty close. I did find some purple that matched pretty close, but I mean, I have thrown away my cross stitch supplies at least three times over the years. Like I'll get into it, I'll buy some cloth and I'll buy some supplies and then I'll throw it all away. And then I'll get into it again and buy all this stuff again and then throw it all away again. <laughs> Eventually I learned just to keep it small and organized in a bin and that usually works a lot better than just chucking the materials and having to buy them all over again. Um, yeah, so it's it's been interesting and certainly a great project to be working on. It feels really good to be working on this. Now, speaking of projects that feel great to be working on again, the quote behind me I pulled out. This is squares and sashings, uh, and you can come and check it out at leahday.com slash squares. And basically this was a quilt that I designed and quilted in, I think 2012. And it's quilted with a lot of the designs from the book, uh, Free Motion Quilting from Feathers to Flames. So when that book came out, I was also working on a DVD that was this quilt. And uh, long story short, it just kind of got stuck whenever we switched from our old site to our new site system on Shopify. And just for various reasons, I took it off the site and took it down. And Josh, you know, was kind of like, when are you going to put that up? When are you going to turn it into a, a workshop and, and put it back up? You know, people are asking about it. And I don't know, it just, it just got, I just got bogged down with a lot of insecurity and feeling like it wasn't good enough. And, you know, this, this, and this is wrong. You know, I was basically nit nitpicking my own work and kind of looking at how all the negatives, you know, all the way it wasn't good enough and pulled it out, took a look at it, took a look at the videos, and it was like, what have I been making such a big deal about? This is awesome, you know? And so this week I um, took this and shot new videos for the intro and shot, um, you know, basically just, you know, a, a good set of beginning videos just to make the quilt, to know how to put it together, you know, and then a free motion quilting basics video just to cover the basics, those, you know, general terms, all that kind of good stuff that I like to start a workshop with. And that felt great too. And, you know, it's one of those things where I feel like Whole30, the diet that I've been on this month, it's helped me lose weight in more ways than one, uh, that, 
kicking sugar out of my life, I felt like so much of my anxiety and insecurity was exacerbated by the fact that I was constantly going from sugar high to sugar high, right? You know, I'd eat something sugary sweet uh, and throw some caffeine on top of that. And then, you know, just basically be kind of unable to really think through things logically and, um, and cut out the emotion that was coming from it. So I feel like I've lost a lot of mental weight too. I mean, this is, it's, it's really fascinating and I, it was something I was completely not expecting. And uh, yeah, I knocked it out and this is gonna be a new workshop that's gonna be on leahday.com. And I, it's gonna be a couple more weeks before we get everything wrapped up. I wanna work on the learning guide, the PDF that comes with it. Uh, and of course, Josh needs to edit the videos that I shot last week, but this is definitely gonna be something coming soon. So that feels, awesome and it's honestly it's like a superhero like you know knowing how to fly or something once I um once I figured out this and and I've kind of I feel like I've gotten it out of the stuck state now I'm like well what else can I do <laughs> you know what else is is in this weird state and last week I talked about how I wrote my business a letter you know and I you know, I think that some of this is a product of that too, where, you know, my business is kind of patiently going, well, Leah, we'd be able to do so much more together if you would just stop feeling so bad about everything all the time. And that's been powerful too. So um, yeah, that, all of that feels really, really great. And, you know, I think that we can be our own worst critics, or at least I know I am my own worst critic. And the things that I see that are wrong or not uh, not perfect, no one else would notice it. No one else would see it. It's not a problem. It's not a deal breaker. And, uh, you know, sometimes I will write myself the worst review I can possibly imagine. And then I'll go back and read it about six months later. And I have to laugh because it's such, it's so evil. I mean, it's like, I write myself this review that is like such a personal, horrible attack on who I am. And it's like no one, number one, no one would do that because it's just awful. And then number two, um, you know, people don't really usually do that. You know, if, you know, if they give you a one star review, it's usually just like book wasn't for me, you know, something like that. So I'm, I'm really working on letting go of these fears and moving forward and and really flowing, getting into this really great energy flow, and that's feeling great. Uh, now, a little update about Mally the Maker. Thank you guys so much for your excitement and support about this book. Uh, I have been working on a fiction novel for several months about a little girl in a quilt and her adventure looking for her grandma who's went who's gone missing. <laughs> little little uh, little teasers there. Um, so this week. I realized that I needed to go back and edit three scenes. These are the scenes with the bad guy. And, um, and kind of dealt with a little bit of insecurity and, and fear because it's like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. <laughs> and I think all writers go through this. I, I was talking to Josh like, oh my gosh, this is just awful. And he was like, it's all right, it's all right. You know, just keep going, figure it out, figure out what needs to happen in your plot, finish the book. Uh, and then it's been so nice to have emails from people who want to be early readers. It's super, super helpful because that's pushing me. I can't just stop. I cannot, you know, put it away or let it get stuck. I've got to keep moving with it. So I've been working on these three scenes just to get them nailed down. Once those three scenes are nailed down, then I'm, I, I kind of have the end of the book. I have that solid and, uh, and it'll be done you know, and then I'm going to be doing some really hardcore editing on it. Uh, and I'm using my phone. So what I do is I read the section. So I'm reading like one scene at a time to myself and I record it and then I play it back and I play it back while I'm quilting or doing something like that. And I listen to audiobook far more than I read physical books. I just don't have time to set and read a physical book most of the time. So when I'm listening to audio, it's like my brain is processing it in that different way. And I'm able to instantly say, you don't need to say that. You know, you can cut that section, that's redundant. You know, and I'm able to hear it. And then I just have to remember to go back to the book and make those edits, make those changes. So that's been really fun. 
And definitely, uh, you know, that was part of the feeling that it was terrible. It was like, oh my gosh, this is reading as like the worst audiobook ever. <laughs> um, but, you know, every book I think starts there. And that's what editors, that's what they do. You know, they take the story and they polish it up and they remove all the adverbs, <laughs> which I have way too many right now. Uh, and and then, you know, they, they turn it into what it's supposed to be. And I think that's that's a powerful thing, and I'm, I'm definitely going to be uh, not in any way egotistical about this book. It needs to have some polishing and some work done in order to really, you know, it's like, you know, a, a, a gemstone. It's ugly when it comes out of the earth, but, you know, once you polish it up and cut it and make it pretty, then it's gorgeous, right? So I feel like this is the exact same way. And I have a deadline for myself, and that is March 15th to get it all wrapped up and ready to send to early readers. That means I will need to edit it. Josh needs to edit it all before then. And I do think that's a doable date, you know? And if it's not, of course, I can always push it back. Um, but I think that's a doable date to be sending it to early readers and getting some help and feedback. Um, and I really do appreciate all the sweet comments on YouTube and my blog. Um, several people wrote in last week and were like, you know, take care of yourself, you know, you're working too hard. And the thing about it is, is, you know, the time in my life when burnout was a real thing and workaholism was a real thing was 2010, 2011. You know, so I've, I've been there and done that. And I've, and I've fi already figured my way out through that whole maze of crazy. And a lot of that had to do with just the stress of building the business fast enough and big enough to support my family. And that was a really scary time. I, I didn't believe that I was good enough to build my business to support my family. And, and it, it was just a lot of stress. And I had, a, you know, a young kid and Josh wasn't working with me yet. And it was hard to manage all of it at once. So I can say things are so much easier now because I have Josh's help and I have dad's help and we really are a great team. Um, but that said, you know, I still have that pressure to make sure that, you know, we pay our bills every month and all that kind of stuff. So the pressure is there, but I gotta say, I would not wanna be doing anything else. This is my dream life. This is my dream career. Um, and, you know, working on Mally the Maker is something that's really unexpected. Uh, to be writing a fiction novel is something I never thought that I would wanna do. And now it's all I wanna do, you know? So uh, feeling like things can adjust and I can have the time to work on this and that that's worth it you know, that's been a transition, feeling like, okay, I can take the time to go and devote to this novel, and I can back off just a little bit on my posts and on tutorials and stuff, and it's worth it to take this time in order to potentially create something even more awesome and new that I, I didn't even think I could create. So um, it's a process, it really is, but I please don't worry, I'm not working too hard. In fact, actually, I feel better than I have in years. I feel amazing. And I am nearing the end of my Whole30 diet, and I don't think I am gonna go back to eating sugar. Um, yeah, we got a divorce and it's permanent. <laughs> Sign my name on the dotted line and it's over. Um, you know, I might not be quite as strict about things like, uh, I think Holder, like no peanut butter. That seems just a little bit silly to me. Peanut butter doesn't mess up my stomach. So I don't see a problem about putting that back in my diet. Um, but you know, I don't, I don't miss bread. Mostly I think the reason I ate so many sandwiches is just because it was routine and habit. And now I have different habits. Now I will cook myself a good lunch and, you know, or eat leftovers from the night before. And I'm much better about making a little extra food to make that happen. So it's changed my lifestyle and then I'm feeling better. So why would I go back to the way I was before? You know, why would I go back to feeling stressed out and like yo-yoing, feeling great, then feeling terrible and really bad headaches that I was experiencing that I think were sugar related. So it's all been a process. Um, it was amazing challenge and I'm so glad that I took it on. And, um, and yeah, I am definitely losing weight. <laughs> you know, if that's the benchmark kind of test of a diet, uh, then yeah, that's definitely happening too. But I think the more important thing that I didn't expect and I'm so happy about is the change in my mental health and feeling so much happier and feeling so much better on that end too. 
So that's really the updates for around the house. We did have a really big tutorial this week. You definitely want to go check out and that is how to make a tumbling block sunrise quilt. Here's a picture of it. And of course you can find links in the show notes, but you can also just go to leahday.com slash tumble to go and check it out. And this is a little mini quilt. It came out at 16 inches square and I love this thing. It is so awesome. Uh, basically, I have wanted to make a tumbling blocks quilt for years and I've always put it off because I thought you had to have Y seams, that you had to piece it with Y seams and do all three diamonds in order to make that tumbling blocks effect. Well, we received a really awesome ruler in this month's quilty box called a Sidekick Ruler designed by Jaybird Quilts. And you don't have to do all diamonds. You can split the lightest diamonds in half and piece it in, with strip piecing and chain piecing. So that's what I did. I, um, I designed this little mini quilt. I cut out hundreds of little diamonds and triangles and half triangle shapes and pieced it all together and I had a ball. It was really, really fun. And this is the thing, I'm giving in to my desire to nerd out and geek out on stuff. And if I wanna sit there and piece a million little tiny diamonds together and I've got the time to do it, then we're gonna do it, you know? I wanna turn, start doing, with Quilty Box, I wanna start doing the projects that I really wanna create and the things that I'm really um, feeling excited about. You know, not just the easiest, quickest, fastest option. And you know, the quilts might get smaller, you know? I might design minis instead of, you know, big throw size quilts, simply because, you know, I might not have the time to do a million different blocks. But it was just a lot of fun to tackle this and to create the tutorial, and I had a great time working on it. And then now I've got this cute little mini that I think I'm gonna turn into a, a hoop quilt to hang on my wall. So that was a lot of fun, and you can check out the tutorial for that at leahday.com slash tumble. And don't forget, every Friday we are still quilting along with new walking foot quilting designs. So uh, last week we learned how to quilt curving lines, really simple design, but if you quilt curves and the curve is too deep and you're quilting with a walking foot, you can start getting whiskers. And whiskers are those like really subtle little ripples that you start seeing over your quilt. So share a lot of tips on avoiding the whiskers, on how to deal with that, you know, to stop them from becoming full-fledged pleats on your quilt. So definitely check out that tutorial too. You can find those linked up at leahday.com slash 2018. And that's where all of the videos are posted for our 2018 machine quilting party. So that is what's been going up. Um, pretty much through the month, month of March, we're gonna just have the Friday videos sharing a new walking foot quilting design. And then in April, we will begin a new quilt and that is Prism Path. And it's a bright, beautiful baby quilt with a rainbow of colors. And you can actually find those exact fabrics in a fat quarter pack if you wanna make the exact same fat, uh, same quilt that I'm working on, and you can find those fat quarters at leahday.com slash rainbow batik. So you can come and check that out too. Okay, that's pretty much it for all of the updates around the house. I hope that you enjoy hearing what's going on and learning a little bit more about me. Um, it is a process and you know, everybody has ups and downs, everybody has issues, and I want you to know that it's not perfect, um, but I couldn't do this without your support. I really couldn't. Uh, it's amazing to get all of the wonderful comments on YouTube and sweet emails that we get every week. I really do appreciate that. And if you'd like to support the podcast, just come and check out our shop, leahday.com slash shop. You can find tools and books, some fabrics, and uh, video workshops to guide you along through a fun quilting project and learn a lot with me. So come and check that out at leahday.com slash shop. And now here's the podcast episode with Laura Lynn Fulfert about long arm quilting. Hello, my quilting friends. Leah Day here with Laura Lynn Fulford. Welcome to the show, Laura Lynn. Hello. Thank you, everybody. Happy <laughs> to be here. Thank you, Leah. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on. So a little introduction. She is a long arm quilter from Canada and is the mom from the Mom and Pop Quilt Shop on YouTube. Laura Lynn shares videos on quilting on a long arm as well as fun quilt along projects. And you can find her website at www.wesewit.ca. So let's get started with what's on your long arm quilting frame right now. What are you working on right today? I literally, I, I wish I could take a picture of it so you could see it. It's actually a uh, fellow, I'm a crossing guard as well as a long armor, but that's, you know, a while ago. Um, but she's also another um, crossing guard and got into quilting just recently, just about a year ago. Um, so came to me for directions and so on and so forth. This is her third quilt and it's for her mom for Christmas. And she wanted really much of a floral print on it and flowers and leaves and swirls and all sorts of beautiful stuff so I had literally just finished off the border doing the border and the border corners just like before you were calling <laughs> <laughs> so I, it's, it's lovely it's love she's gonna love it it's, it's quite pretty so and she used a bunch of scrap fabrics that were uh, normally do for like um, draperies or something so and backed it and yeah she it's, it's lovely she did a really good job so tell me about your quilting setup what's the machine and quilting frame that you're using right now I have a Gamel Statler Stitcher. It is uh, 14 feet, well, to accommodate the space-wise, we need 16 feet by 7 uh, to be able to go all the way around it, and so it's not going to whack any windows or doors or anything, because as you know, the long arm head goes back and forth, and you need to accommodate for that space as well. Uh, so it's actually a 12-foot uh, steel frame. It has a computer. Of course, that's the most expensive part of the long arm itself because the computer drives the belts and so on and so forth when it stitches out a pattern. Um, and uh, I love it. I love my Statler stitcher. I have a for the stitch. Um, uh, I guess the the width of what I can do per pass is twenty four inches. Wow. So twenty. Yeah, it's two feet. And I mean, you could put a you know, lots on there for two feet. It really, you, you can. So, um, uh, I love it. I, I don't know what I, how I did without it. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I just, I've just picked up my first long arm. Uh, it is the Grace Cunique and I have it on a frame and it's the first time I've ever done that. And I agree with you and it, and it really does feel like, oh my gosh, this is such a relief to have the machine moving. Yes. Yeah. And it's nice when you can work with it right it's your flair as well as I call mine Walt I figured he cost me so much money I had to give him a name so honestly I could have had a Mercedes I could have had a BMW I could have had a Lexus I chose a Walt so <laughs> and actually the guys when they came to set it up they helped well, I was going to call it Walt Asina but the the young man was like you can't call that machine a Walt Asina so Walt it is <laughs> nonetheless you know um yeah it's it, it's a part of your life. It really does. And so I, you know, I refer to it almost as in like in a third person's way, like, oh, Walt's doing some work and then I'll do some work sort of thing, you know, to explain that it's a computer working as well as me. And I like how we can really make something like, I don't know, something plain just shine like a whole cloth sort of thing right you know it does some I do some you know it, it finishes out the pattern or the quilt quite nicely so yeah absolutely and just to be clear I, some quilters that are listening might not know anything about long arming and um, the automation process so that's what you're talking about with yes, the computer yeah. so um, yeah. just tell me a little bit about the automation process like how do you how do you tell it what to stitch um, I could pick a zone or say if I wanted to do an edge to edge. So I'd go from the upper left hand corner all the way to I, I try to lay the longest side on the quilt. So it's le um, less rows to row. Yeah, to to rotate. Right. So um, you go all the way across and say, you know, um, five feet so we'll click it at the left and click it at the right. And then it wants you to come down as far as it knows on which bed to go in like down to the like the 24 25 inch mark and then you click it again and so on and so forth so we say we want a paisley pattern and we want it to go the five inch uh, five feet by whatever say five feet five by five feet say you know 60 inches by 60 inches um and we'll go with that and then uh it says it it automatically gives you an option it says okay i'm going to fill it out for you on, I'm going to do five rows of paisleys and you go, oh, okay, that's too dense. That's not what they're looking for. Or that you want it even denser. So you can go, I want seven rows and then you change it to seven rows and then it can, you can kind of tweak it somewhere in between there, whether you want 
um, a little bit of space in between the rows to go, like between the pattern, or you can kind of tweak it so it comes up a little bit closer. You know, those are those options with that computer and the software. And it's going to know when you stick, you hit the go and button and it's just going to stitch out all that it can within that two rows or, you know, per pass. Sometimes you get two passes depending on the size of the pattern. Um, and it, 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 you know, you have to give it parameters or a destination of where you want it to go or it's, it's not going to go. Um, if you say you were to, if you're setting out a whole pattern, you click one pattern, you want to copy that and it's switched from a sewn, uh, unsewn to a sewn and you move that down like beyond its area where it can actually function, it will try and stitch that out. It will like the move, machine head will try and move and go and then it goes bonk up against the board and goes, ah, I can't get there. We're like, oh yeah, whoops, you know click that one out. <laughs> it's done that a couple of times. So it does, it will do what you want it to do, no matter where you want it to do it. So, um, but I do like that because you can really set out uh, or click out wonky borders. Some little ones that are a little wavy and you want to make sure you're going to stretch that pattern. So it goes all the way up into the corner or come right down a bit, you know, not every border is perfect, right? So some need a little loving. And uh, that's one of the benefits of having a computer. <laughs> yes, definitely. And, you know, I think the, the thing that I think about whenever I think of automation is just turning a whole long arm into like an embroidery machine. Do you agree with mm -hmm. that? You, you kind of almost can, especially with the whole, uh, whole cloth sort of idea. You can set it out any way you like it. Um, I just did... Um, one, it was for their Oma. It was two girls who were doing, we do sewing lessons here at the shop too. I, I am, because of Crossing Guard, you know, you kind of get connected with the people around here and, and you want little ones interested for sure all the time. So we were working on one for their Oma and we put their names all the way on it. Like we stitched it with, with the machine. We set out, you know, with the letter, how we want it to look, how big, how wide, how, and then on the angle, we can, we can twist it any way we like. So their names were coming out of the sun, like sun rays of all the grandchildren. So, you know, that just made that much more special of a, you know, a unique sort of item, but it was a whole cloth. It was just the gray fabric that we used to stitch it out on and it turned out beautiful in the end. And it's just, you think, oh, just gray fabric, right? But it's going to mean so much more to her Absolutely. because of this whole, you know, uniqueness of it. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. So um, tell me about your shop. You said you, you have a shop and that's in Canada. So Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah, we rent it out of our house. Um, it's I took over the living room and the dining room. <laughs> when it's big space, you kind of just link it in between. <laughs> um, it's what we had the most uh, area to use. I mean, I would love to have had an outside building to be able to put it in. And then that way, you know, it kind of separates the house from the business, which, you know, you're always passing through through the long arm it's like hi <laughs> you never seem to walk away from it as I'm sure you well know right if it's always in your space um but I, I I like it because you know I'm I'm back and forth I can have people come here and you know and and it's not just long arming it's you know I got fabric here as well and you know we don't mind printing out patterns for people either if they you know if they're having issues or something like that we're kind of techie here too um and as well as, you know, I have people coming in for alterations, you know, I, I do alterations and zippers and hems and fixes and, you know, bride straight, bride's dresses, grad dresses, whatever. <laughs> wow. It sounds so, like... yeah, it's, just, it's a tiny, it's a, it's a small space, but we try to make the best of it. Wow. It sounds like you're kind of a Jill of all trades. You kind of do a little bit of everything. So how Thank did, you. how did your business start? Tell me that story. Uh, that's kind of a interesting story. Uh, I've always sewn from just we right underneath my mom's sewing machine because she's she's a little person, so she's always had to um, uh, hem her pants even if they were petite. <laughs> so <clears throat> sorry. I'd always end up with a little bit of strip of fabric from the bottom of her pants. And, of course, it makes Barbie beds and dresses and all sorts of stuff with that little bit of fabric. So um, I've always sewn. But uh, it was um, – I was working down uh, not too far from here. It's about my, our house uh, when we first moved here. And um, – one of my other co-workers knew, was my neighbor, and she knew I'd sewn. We were talking about sewing and stuff like that. And I was at the cash, and a customer had come up behind, was at her till, and said, hey, you know, Donna, do you know anybody who can hem my pants? And she kind of went, <clears throat> and I turned around and thought, okay, here's, I could either help her or I could just, you know, say no, right? So I immediately went, hi, I'm Lauren Lynn. I can help. You know, I can help hem your pants. And literally from there, just kind of went from, 
word of mouth and, oh, I need a jacket fixed, so can you fix that? Or I ripped my pants, can you fix that? Or, you know, my, the kid's got brand new snow pants and tore out the knee, can you do something about that? Okay, there's jean patches, we can do that, you know. There's there's ways to work around it. So it kind of built up from there. And because I was, a, you know, a local person and I was the crossing guard and I worked at the convenience store or the grocery store, so you kind of get to know everybody. And then, you know, pick up and drop off. And you're like, oh, what's going on there? I'm like, oh, I fixed their pants. Oh, you do that? So it'd be like, oh, I got this and this. So slowly it grew and grew and grew. And then it ended up being so busy. I was busy every day with mending, fixing, tweaking, quilting, whatever, bag making. And uh, and it just kind of grew, grew, grew until we thought, you know what, maybe we should make this, uh, you know, a full-time thing. So let's look into a small business loan and see how much the machine is. And we didn't just get um, the Statler Stitcher. We also got a Janome Horizon 15,000. So, um, and you have like six patterns on there, my dear. I, I saw did. that. I had that <laughs> I machine saw that too. like two years ago when I got it. I'm like, oh, I know her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have that machine too. I love it. So the Janome Horizon 15,000 is a honkin' embroidery machine. It is a beast, oh, yeah. and I and it, love it. It does. It, it's done me very well doing stockings for this Christmas and last Christmas, doing little embroidery and names, and I've got some jackets to do and some backpacks to do, and it's, it's fun putting people's names on things, especially when you have a unique name, like myself and like you. You're not going to go to the, you know, T-shirt store and find your name on a shirt, right? So, you know. Though I like the bonus, I used to get sometimes two chocolates or two ornaments if it was Laura and then Lynn. <laughs> I got two. <laughs> yeah, you could kind of glue them together. <laughs> but yeah, no, I love my Janome. Um, so we thought, you know, take the investment. I was always, I had a Janome before, um, and I, I just really liked the machine. I thought it was pretty reliable. I liked the embroidery feature. We thought about getting two different machines, like one workhorse and then one embroidery machine. And then we were like, you know what, maybe we should just focus on the one. If it takes off and we're happy and this, you know, turns back into the workhorse and get another, like maybe a four or five or six color embroider, you know, so it's all together and just loop it up and let it do its stuff. So, but it does beautiful things. We just did a monarch butterfly and it would be almost like it was real. Like it was so real the way it stitched out it was beautiful yeah. wow so are you digitizing too or just buying designs what, what's your focus just buying about? designs yeah yeah I actually did do a little um we tried to digitize our own logo of the mama pop quilt shop um and we did kind of stitch that out but uh there was some things we need to tweak it's always the designer right and, it, and the design software and how it implements with this and you know there's always tweaking there's always tweaking with everything <laughs> absolutely I completely agree so um do you do a lot of like you know custom monogramming and stuff like that with the embroidery machine is that part a big part of your business or is that kind of a smaller part it's more of the smaller part i'd say the biggest part right now is um putting um quilts together that maybe family members didn't quite get to finish so that's kind of like been for some reason was very popular this year I did like four or five of them were like okay my auntie Jane couldn't finish this she's passed away I'd like to be able to give it to you know her daughter or something like that can you finish this I'm like okay and it's so nice to take on those projects because it's fabric that I've never even seen before I don't even think they've seen the light of day in probably 30 40 years so I'm like okay do I stabilize this how what's what's the care of this fabric how how do I back it so it's proper and it, it lasts you know all these little things were going through my mind when I want to um I don't know just make their treasure the best possible right so yeah so it's it's a bit it's a mix I get um long arming putting quilts together bags requests you know it's a bit a mix of everything which is what I love I didn't really want to just do one thing so yeah, that makes so much sense. And how do you how do you price for something like that? I mean, I'm just running through my head, you know, like getting a quilt in pieces and trying to turn that into something, and then you know, of course, all you know, all the different steps of that, you know, piecing yes. and quilting and binding and everything. How do you I'm, price that? I'm probably really way under because to me, it's a treasure that I want them to fin to have finished. You know, I'd rather have it finished than sit in a closet for another two years because they couldn't afford to pay, you know, an extra two hundred dollars or something like that. You know what I mean? To me, it's about it's about the the finished product. It's about getting it done, getting it beautiful, getting it on the couch or getting it on the bed or getting it to whoever needs to get to, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm negotiable. You know, if you can help me with my winter tires, so, you know, I'll 
You know what I mean? Like barter system goes a long way in these sorts of situations. I have chickens. I have a girlfriend up the road. I know she doesn't have a lot of funds. So I, you know, switch straw for, you know, things, you know, like say, hey, can I get some straw or, you know, or uh, she gets me to fix her zippers or, you know what I mean? It's a a whole barter system, right? We we help each other out. So um, there's a few customers that are like that. I know they, they don't sometimes have very much to go by, but I know they can, you know, bring me things, you know, or, or do things for me or something like that. You know, if I need a rooster called and then I say, Hey, <laughs> I know it's kind of vicious, but <laughs> it happens. That's the way life is. It really is. It's everyday yeah, life. Yeah, completely. And I love that you're willing to do that with people. I mean, sometimes it's just all like, you know, a dollar figure on everything. And I love hearing yeah. that you are breaking it down and just working with people in the way that it works. And that's kind of an yeah. old school way of doing yeah. it. And I think that's awesome. Yeah. So What's your favorite thing to be working on on your long arm? Like, so you're quilting, you're making videos, you're doing all these different things and sharing online too. So, what's your favorite thing to work on on the long arm? I would say customer quilts and how they want it customized. You know, they say, "Oh, Lorlin, I love what you do. Just, just go for it." And then I'm like, "Uh, what? <laughs> you want me? You want me to do what? You know?" And it, it, it overwhelms me sometimes. And then I look at it and go. Okay, what, so there are questions that I'll say to them, you know, okay, what's your favorite part of this quilt? What was, what was, is it, just, is it the color? Is it the way the shape of the block is? And I'll try and highlight that sort of thing that they love the best about it, right? If they say, okay, what don't you like about it? Okay, well, I don't like the brown there. Okay, so I'm not using brown thread. Does not highlight the brown at all. It's, you know, that sort of thing. So those sorts of um, customization fun stuff that I can put my flair on it and, and and they and they like it hopefully fingers crossed <laughs> and the end and being a little bit more organic like when people say hey you know make me a tree okay well I make a tree but I'm trying to make branches and I'm trying to make branches off those branches and so it looks like a tree like a you know I'm making you a tree I'm not making you a cartoon tree I'm trying to make you a tree tree right so <laughs> wow that sounds really interesting so um I I mentioned I'm I've just gotten my long arm and I'm just learning how to do it. Um, do you have any tips for someone like me getting started? Like, how did you master long arm quilting? Well, I'd say I'm still in the process of that. That's for sure. <laughs> it's always a beginning. Uh, I've only had it for two years, so I'm st- it's, it's, it's definitely a learning process. Um, basting, um, squaring up. See, there's been a, a yes or a no whether to baste your batting. But I find that if I, if I baste my batting as well as my quilt top, then I know within my first couple of rolls, everything's straight. No batting's going to get tucked under. Nothing's going to get folded. You know what I mean? It's all straight. It's all together. Everybody's in the pool together at the same time. That's what I, you know, you know what I mean? So that's why I can highly suggest that, checking your tension on every bobbin, because that's got me in the end, let me tell you, three quarters of way through a quilt, and just, oh, slip it on and pop it in, and off to crossing guard I go and come back to a mess, you know, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, I think I just lost two years off my life, you know, those sorts of things. Um, um, Making sure you have enough, if you only have one spool of thread, then you load enough bobbins to make sure you can do all the quilt and not have to go back and forth, the back and forth, the back and forth, <laughs> or get two, get two. <laughs> when I first started, uh, a fellow long armor says, oh, when you order threads, just order two. And I'm like, why would I order two? What if I don't like the color? Yeah, now I know why. <laughs> just, just in, in case. case you run out. <laughs> <laughs> just in case, yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> so what do you mean by basting the batting? Are you stitching the batting to the backing first before yes. you apply? Okay, and are you doing that with regular thread? Just regular, just whatever's on the long arm, or if I've changed, what I do is I'll try and baste with whatever's threads left over from the previous project, and then I'll switch it to the thread I'm using for that project, and then, you know, and then obviously quilt it, but I, it doesn't really matter, I guess, what sort of thread you're using, as long as you, you baste it, and I just try and do a, a 4.0 stitch, just to, you know, it's not, it's not really tight together, so it's not a 12, it's not a 12 stitch, which is normally what it stitches out, my long arm, uh, 12 stitches per inch, so it's like, you know, four stitches per inch, and it's, it's kind of chunky, but it just, it does that job, it bastes the batting down so it stays there so when you go to do your from your you're done your whole row and you go to roll it again and then again I find I just find it it's less batting get that gets that 
in the way. You know what I mean? Like as you're rolling it, it just sometimes you'll see that as as you as you're doing even bigger projects. I find it with a bigger project, it really needs it. Smaller project, maybe not so much, but especially if you, you know, or if they want. Um, I more recently now than 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 last year was they want to do a rolled back. They want to roll the backing to the front instead of doing a binding. So they'll just roll it. So they say, okay, leave me an extra two inches of batting all the way around. I'm like, okay. <clears throat> so I try to make sure from the top to have like four inches of batting so they can have that extra to play with just in case. And then all the way around it has an extra batting. So they can give it a nice big, you know, binding, I guess. Flip it over. Uh, utilize as much of the fabric as possible, especially if that's what they were doing. So uh, more so than that, that's like I had, I had like six or seven of those for, for, for this year for sure. So... Um, interesting, you know, people want to do it different ways, right? So, yeah. you know, and that's another good reason to base the batting as well is to keep it steady so it's not going to shift anywhere. Yeah. Do you have a video on that? I'd love to see it. Um, I don't think so, but I can certainly do enough for long next Long Arm Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, that would be wonderful. And we'll make sure to put it in the show notes so everybody can find it. That would be great. Perfect. Yes. yes, I can certainly do that. Yeah, so um, you're filming on your long arm, and I've, I've been playing around with that, too, and had Good. kind of questionable results so far. So how do you <laughs> set up your camera, if you don't mind me asking? No, I, I can. I, I don't know. Can you see me? I wasn't sure if you could no, see me. No, I can't see you. Okay, okay. All right. Um, well, we set up, we have a GoPro system, and, and we got the attachment that could go to a bicycle, you know, like the front of the bicycle, where it would, um, around the round bar, it would screw on either side to stabilize it. So we got that, and we attached it to the left-hand side of the handle, and then that was for the longest time, and then we were, I was doing a lot of more um, ruler work and so on and so forth. And I kept banging my hand into the bottom of the case, which, you know, kind of gets irritating after a while. So we ended up switching it over to the right hand side, which I like now. It's a bit of a different angle. Um, but we try to make it sure that it's not like an above view. It's on an angled view. It's almost like, um, I don't know, like, um, I don't know. I don't know how to, how to describe it. Uh, but it is on an angle sort of view down to the long, to the long arm. And you can see how it stitches out and how the head stitches out and the thread and stuff. Um, and then we have one that's a permanent, uh, like a webcam that we linked and taped sort of to the, the, head, to the top of the head and down the neck and towards the back that films the live streams when we've done the long arming on the live stream we've done a, it was a north and south quilt that I did for my uh, friends for their 30th wedding anniversary and then we did like a uh, uh, Christmas tree skirt and you know all sorts of fun stuff and and during the live stream time, normally if I'm sitting at the, the sewing machine, that's one thing. But when you got to go to the, the long arm and go live, it's a bit different. So we want to make sure they had a different view for that as well than the long arm Wednesday. So it's more of an above down sort of look because of the way it has to be positioned. So when I'm moving the the wire doesn't or the cable doesn't get caught up. So yeah. we've had that before. All of a sudden I'm like trying to go left and right and I can't, I can't go anywhere because it got <laughs> caught up on something. I'm like, hey, what's going on? <laughs> oh, but the... it's more of a, it's a tweaking here and tweaking there. You got to find things that work for you. Um, we found things that like, okay, what it, it's going to vibrate. So it's going to move like crazy. So we need a few adaptions and um, uh, like put it in a case for stability. So it's not the camera itself isn't vibrating like crazy. Um, so it's a, like a little bit of foam in that little case. So it sits in there. I mean, there is a little bit of vibration, um, more so when I'm controlling it because I'm faster. You know, when you get into the groove of things, you're just going woo to do to do all over the place and, you know, doing your loop de loops and swirly whirlies and, and having a good time. And then you don't realize you're vibrating the whole house at that point in time. And, you know, <laughs> you're like, you know, glasses are chinging and so on and so forth. But, um, it, that's, it really does, you know, like when I'm, when I'm quilting it, it goes, it does a little vibrate, but, uh, I try, try to slow down sometimes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I yeah. Was, I can slow down. <laughs> what was interesting is when I started sharing about, you know, making the videos and I was playing around with lots of different camera angles, that's when I heard about you as a lot of people on YouTube were like, Oh my gosh, go and talk to Laura Lynn, mom and pop quilt shop and, you know, and see how she does it. And, uh, yeah, that's exactly how I ran across your videos because oh, that's fantastic. yeah, yeah. It's just one of those things where it's like, you know, I'm looking, I'm looking at what other people are 
doing and trying to figure out this from scratch. And it, I mean, it is kind of a weird thing to want to mount a camera to a long arm, but it is. I it figured, is. you know, somebody else has been out there and done it. So, you know, it's great to be able to ask and get some tips and stuff. So that's great. So tell me about Pop. You, The name is Mom and Pop Quilt Shop. So is Pop part of the business too? Yes, he is. He's more, he's behind the camera. He does all the editing. He, um, it was, this was his idea from the get go. He just thought, you know what? He, he says, you have such a bubbly personality. I think you'd be good on YouTube or streaming or whatever. I'm like, ah, yeah, whatever. Right. So anyways, it started off small, but as, as you all know, you end up growing and people start to find you and you know, your share and they share or so on and so forth. So we've, uh, we've grown quite a bit. We just reached 4,400 subscribers, so we're very, you know, excited about that for for YouTube. That's more than we ever thought we'd get without having to bribe them with cookies or something, <laughs> <laughs> or like free gifts, <laughs> something like that. But yeah, he does all that sort of thing. He's he's been the elusive. Of, he's been known as the elusive pop because he doesn't come on camera. He doesn't want to be on camera. He doesn't. That's not his thing, right? He says, you know, that's that's all you. You do the worky stuff. I'll do the behind the the behind stuff so um it has been brought up a couple of times of you know they you know they people want to see them and they you know well it's it's been funny it's been interesting especially on some of the live chats so he was he was a snowman in one of the videos and then when we did the halloween one he was a uh a, a pop a puppet and something else anyways it was really cute i we all loved it but yeah <laughs> so he, he may come on camera at some point in time. I don't know. He does have his own ideas, and he does uh, design a lot. Um, a couple of blocks that we did for our Christmas quilt, we he designed and uh, last year too. And there's just you know we we do things together. We get an idea and we just work on it, and you know we just putter as a as a as the two of us trying to figure stuff out, right? So we wanted this to be our retirement income still have fun because I've always like I said I've always sewn I still want to continue to sew I still want to enjoy the sewing so and as long as he can have fun with it too with the techie part and you know the videotaping and and it says also keeping an archive you know of you know of, of knowledge right you know like um Nancy Zeman right she she all her archives like from right from the get-go I've learned right from right from a little kid from her for sure so it's happy it's sad to see her pass but um, I'm glad that she's left this beautiful legacy for everybody else to enjoy, right? So Absolutely. And that's, that is exactly what a blog or YouTube or, you know, any of these kinds of platforms does is, you know, you can be able to go back and look at these things. And, and then the value of a video going on YouTube, you know, some of my earliest videos are the worst, but people still watch them and get something out of them. So... You know, it's worth it to still put it up. I think that's great. And I have to say, my husband is also the behind the scenes kind of guy, but I did manage to convince him to join me for a quilt along in 2000, I guess that was 2014. And people loved it. And just to be able to see Josh and, you know, be able to, you know, see what he was doing. He was a total beginner on the machine. And so, I mean, if you're ever wanting to like, have something go viral. Get pop on the machine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I said to him, you realize that if you do actually get on camera, I said that people are going to be like so crazy. Because, <laughs> well, maybe we'll save it for something big and special. Or I'm like, like what? <laughs> like, <laughs> we'll see. We'll see if it ever pops out there. You never know. <laughs> yeah. So I have one more question about your, um, your quilts for kids. You have on your website that you're always accepting donations and you're making quilts for kids that have survived traumatic events. So tell me about about that charity and how you make those quilts actually it goes to the uh, local fire department what I do is I make a little bag for it and on that bag I kind of stitch a whether it's green or blue or pink or purple and then they know that it's a girl quilt or a boy quilt and if some because we had a house fire and um, I understand the, the the traumatic of that and sometimes if you're in the back of a cop car and have just a little quilt to cuddle up with sometimes that changes things it really does yeah, I completely agree. I think that's wonderful. Uh, so this is the question I always ask everybody. What are you most looking forward to in the next five years? Oh, geez. <laughs> <laughs> well, first would be, you know, Walt would be, you know, I, I wouldn't have to worry about him anymore. And I could just, you know, have some fun, fun, you know. Uh, but I do enjoy I, I love doing stuff for charity. I really do. So I definitely I will always keep up with that. It's more like how can I 
beat myself from the last year sort of thing, you know, like what can else can we do? What else can we do? Uh, especially to get back. Like I said, I have this big machine. I hate to see it sit there empty. So if people have tops and want to donate them, I'm more than willing to find some batting and put some backing on it and a way to go off to Ronald McDonald House, local charities, you know, anything like that is, is it, it helps everybody. Um, I don't know. I think I would like my, I know my own space for Walt, you know, for this quilt shop. You know what I mean? Like, uh, we've talked about putting a yurt. You, do you know what a yurt yes, is? Uh -huh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Isn't it, is that a great idea? A nice 24, you know, something size yurt. Put your fabrics all the way around the corner, the machines in the center. And I think that would be a lovely little quilt shop, right? So as long as we get the power to it. So it is Canada. So it has to have some sort of, some, some sort of heat source. <laughs> Um, I don't know, just experimenting more on, on the long arm too and getting more confident in myself. And, you know, two years isn't a lot on the long arm. I did do lots of free motion before that on my own domestic. You know, that's how you get started with this. And then you're like, okay, well, I've done like five queen size quilts. My shoulders are killing me. What else? How, how can I get this done? Obviously, yeah, this is what I like to do. So what else can I do to get this, make it this happen, right? So, you know, those sorts of things. I, I don't know. I'm always looking forward to the future. There's always something to be happy about and always something to be celebrated. So as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. So I wish you the best of luck with all of that. Um, let everybody know where they can find you online so they can come out and check out your videos and your quilt shop. Uh, on YouTube, it's Mom and Pop Quilt Shop, and we're on Facebook, and then www.wesewit.ca for our webpage. And we have fabrics up there, too, if you're interested. So, Excellent. Well, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Oh, thank you very much for inviting me. I was totally over the moon excited and still am. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. So that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed meeting Laura Lynn and you're excited about watching her videos on YouTube and checking out her website. You can find it at wesewit.ca. Laura Lynn has also shared a video on how to baste a quilt on a long arm and how to baste just the batting. So make sure to check that out. You can find it in the show notes. And you find all of the episodes plus show notes all linked up at leahday.com slash podcast. So come and check that out. And if you'd like to support the show and help it continue coming out with new videos and podcast episodes every single week, come and check out our quilt shop at leahday.com slash shop. We have lots of tools, supplies, beautiful quilting fabrics, as well as books and quilting workshops to guide you step by step through a quilting project with me. So come and support the quilt shop and help create more episodes of the Hello My Quilting Friends podcast. Check it out at leahday.com shop. Until next time, let's go quilt.